Welcome everybody to Behind the Lens. This is the first episode that I'm doing today. My name's Greg Sheard and I am joined today by an amazing wildlife photographer, Lara Jackson. Welcome, Lara. Thank you so much for having me. And I have to apologise because I've got the washing machine going in the background. So if you can hear noises. <laughs> I didn't time that really well, did I, Greg? Uh, no worries at all. Well, I've got a guy with a lawnmower outside as well. So <laughs> hopefully you guys don't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah it's great to be here so thank you for for asking me to be involved yeah no absolutely i mean um just having you on board as say the first person in this kind of series is is amazing um obviously having a, a woman in wildlife photography is you know a good thing to have as well because it's a very male dominated kind of industry um so obviously we're going to talk about your successes um in a, in a moment and just to kind of hear those stories is going to be very inspiring, I hope, for many, many people out there, you know, especially women who want to pick up, say, wildlife photography and conservation as well. Yeah, definitely. I think that there's 100% more women and more girls coming into photography and conservation. In fact, when I was doing my degree at university, I would say the majority of people on my course were women. Yeah. Um, but I think there's still like a lack of conversion from higher education into actual jobs where um, women are represented. And as you said, like wildlife photography in particular, um, I think there are women out there, but they're just so underrepresented compared to our male counterparts. So Absolutely. I think it's interesting to follow the space over the next few years to see whether, you know, like companies support women a bit more and give them those opportunities. And um, my washing machine's going mad. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Don't worry. I, I can't really hear it that much. So don't worry at all. Okay, just, fine. Like, a little bit of the drum. And then it was just like, no, back to normal again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it, I mean, it's been an incredible journey for you, obviously, over the last, say, five plus years. You know, you've gone from graduating university with degrees in zoology and wildlife conservation to becoming an award winning photographer and even an author. But where did all of this kind of begin for you? Well, well photo where did photography begin or where did everything um, say, say kind of both, like going back to the very beginning, you know, um, getting into yeah. conservation and then how that moved into photography? Uh, I guess I kind of have to go back to the beginning because um, I always loved animals, but I thought the only career that was available to you was to be a vet. Yeah. Um, so for like my whole life, I just thought that was what I was going to do because it was the only career possible to work with animals. Like I didn't even know that you could work in conservation until I got to university. Okay. Um, and anyway, I like dropped chemistry A level. So that shut pretty much all the doors on going to veterinary science for university. And um, I actually, so I got um, good A level grades in the end, but I went through clearing and I started doing a year of oceanography at Southampton realized it wasn't for me and that's when I found out about zoology so I think it's um probably a bit of a failing in the school system that the only careers you're really told about are like becoming a doctor or a vet or a firefighter or a policeman um I feel like there's so many careers out there that you just never hear of and yeah so it wasn't until I was at university that I heard about zoology which is basically a biology degree but instead of having to do human aspects like human physiology or anything to do with plants you get to pick any module related to animals and wildlife and conservation and ecology and biodiversity just sounded right up my street so I changed course after a year um loved zoology loved it so much loved the field work aspect of things where I had to go out and you know spend six weeks somewhere collecting data on something and decided I would stay to do a master's in wildlife conservation which I absolutely loved and I spent three months working in Kenya researching black rhino feeding ecology, which was just a dream come, come true for someone who's always been obsessed with wildlife and African wildlife in particular. Yeah. And I guess it was those opportunities to have long, prolonged periods of time in the field where the love for photography began. So I, I actually only picked up a camera at the age of 21. And it was after my first ever trip away from home. I went to Madagascar to collect data for my undergraduate dissertation. And I only had an action camera, which of course you can't get any good wildlife portraits at all. <laughs> so I was trying to show my family the, the wildlife that I'd seen there. I was having to borrow other people's photos, which was really frustrating. So 
um, I went to a shop and I picked up a little bridge camera. And then I had two subsequent trips, uh, like university field trips, one to Belize for a tropical ecology field trip. And then um, I had one to Kenya and then obviously my long master's research trip in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was just hooked. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I do. I think it wasn't really until the pandemic where the photography started to overtake the conservation because before the pandemic, I was managing a dolphin research project in Zanzibar. And then obviously COVID hit, all our funding got pulled. Um, and it was only then that I thought, well, I love my photography so much. Like I want to use it as a way to raise awareness for conservation. I'll, I'll see if I can turn it into my career. And it sort of snowballed from there. Uh, that's incredible. And was there, was there anybody like when you were young who was like maybe a big influence on you? Well, I always loved David Attenborough and all of the wildlife documentaries on BBC. So I guess like, that was a huge inspiration for me. Um, Steve Irwin, before he died, I loved. Yeah, he was um, my hero. <laughs> oh, he was just absolutely fantastic. And I think like really ignited the passion in so many young people for wildlife. Um, but as I said, like I didn't know that you could work in conservation. So I guess I didn't really have many heroes beyond that because I just didn't realize it was a career that was possible. Yeah, I mean, I remember back when I was younger, like every Sunday without fail, like it was Crocodile Hunter on the Discovery Channel at eight o'clock. And I was I was hooked for years and years and years. And I started looking at going to like James Cook University in Australia to study to study zoology. Um, I then actually applied to be a volunteer at Australia Zoo. Um, wow. I think it was when I was 16, 17 was when Steve Irwin died and I was literally just filling out the paperwork when I found out and oh. that actually it, it stopped me from going I, I never went in the end I never went into zoology in the end I just I was broken he was the, he had that much of a positive influence on me um, but to see the work that say his son and his daughter are doing like Robert and um and Bindi is absolutely amazing that they're continuing it on yeah they're fantastic um but that's such a shame you didn't ever go and complete your dream studies um, yeah like i've actually started like with the open university environmental science now um so so that's it's it's always been a passion of mine it's kind of getting myself back into it but especially through wildlife photography it's yes. just incredible and you know the passion obviously that both of us share for these amazing animals around the world is 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 fantastic yeah well that's awesome like good for you yeah <laughs> thank you um now obviously in 2021 uh you've got that very iconic lioness image um which i say i absolutely adore and it was highly commended in the annual animal portraits category of the wildlife photographer of the year competition um i mean before we kind of go on to about how that kind of felt for you i mean tell us about how you managed to capture the image um yeah so first of all it was like a complete dream come true and it still feels really surreal that that even happened to me um but basically during the pandemic i don't know if you remember but there after the first lockdown there was that sweet period in the summer where all of the cases dropped the pubs reopened in the uk yeah. um and at the time there was no restriction on international travel at all and my partner george who's also a wildlife photographer um, and I, we were asked by a client to actually go to Africa to document the impact of the lack of tourism. Um, obviously, in Africa, the majority of reserves and conservancies heavily rely on the revenue generated by tourism to fund anti-poaching efforts, security ranges and things like that. So the sort of overnight stopping, um, the overnight stop in travel had a huge, huge negative impact on conservation in Africa. So um, yeah, we were asked to, to head out to Tanzania and we ended up being there for two months, which was incredible. And it was amazing to sort of escape everything that was going on back home. And it really felt like it was a, an important thing to document as well. Um, but it just so happens that we were in Tanzania during July and August, which of course is the peak of the wildebeest migration. Yeah. And at a time where tourism would usually be heaving and there would be hundreds of cars in the Serengeti, we were the only one, which was so strange. It felt like an apocalypse or something. It's kind of um, nice for yourself though, isn't it? But maybe not, obviously not for the kind of companies involved in it because people are going to lose their jobs and all sorts, but to kind of have those moments to yourself is just very special. Yeah. I think definitely just so surreal, I guess, is the yeah. sort of word I would use for it. I think 
the last time that happened was probably before tourism even began in East Africa, <laughs> 60s or something, and it probably won't ever happen again. So it was a very unique position to be in. Um, but yeah, so it was a wildebeest migration. Obviously, you've got millions of antelope species moving through the Serengeti ecosystem. And we were actually waiting for the crossings to start, so for the wildebeest to cross uh, the Mara River. Mm -hmm. And whilst we were waiting, we saw um, a commotion at the corner of our eye, turned around and, and saw like a light tail basically flecking in the grass. The so drove over and this lioness had just taken down a wildebeest and it wasn't clean, the kill. Um, we think she was pretty young and quite inexperienced. She was also quite full already, so it was definitely like an opportunistic kill. She didn't she didn't need to eat, but she I think she came across the world beast just lying in the grass and obviously pounced. <laughs> um, and yeah, she started eating whilst the poor wildebeest was still alive. So um, I guess that's why her muzzle's covered in this like fresh red oxygenated blood. Yeah. And we pulled the vehicle a little closer, obviously still maintaining a respectful distance. And she looked straight down the lens of my camera and had a paw on the, the body of the wildebeest. And <laughs> I think it's one of the only times I've been fully intimidated by a lion. It was, yeah, I wouldn't want to cross her. <laughs> Oh, I imagine not. I mean, that eye contact in the image is just, it draws you in completely. And then, and then after that, you see all the blood, you know, this oxygenate, oxygenated blood over the, over the face. And you're just like, wow, you know, it, it's such an incredible image. It's powerful. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I would like to say that I did all the work, but I think it was just her and, uh, and the situation that I found myself in because um I've, I've never come across anything like that before and i doubt i ever will again um okay. even when you eat like a hunt the animals usually eat dead before they start eating so you never get that like blood all over the face yeah um, it'd be more like coagulated and yeah, so <laughs> just around the mouth and things like that so, yeah, yeah. Was, it, was it like a, a a juvenile wildebeest or was it like a full-grown wildebeest that this lioness went for full-grown adult um which is why i think she didn't she lacked the strength to completely kill it so yeah uh, the grizzly details like it was alive for about 10 minutes as she was eating which yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> really hard, it was really hard to watch because uh obviously like i'm a scientist so the scientist in me was thinking this is fascinating i can't believe this is happening right in front of me yeah and then the, like the part of me that is really compassionate and cares for wildlife like i don't think any animal deserves that kind of death so i did find it really hard to watch but i think actually that's okay like, taking photos helped me to sort of separate the incident from what was happening in front of me and that i could view it through the lens and think about it creatively rather than yeah getting lost in a in a hole of <laughs> of sadness for this poor wildebeest so. I mean, I can imagine. nature is brutal in itself it's, it's beautiful yeah. and brutal at the same time and you have to you have to capture both of those sides of it unfortunately but also fortunately because it's you know it's it's giving you this incredible opportunity of say winning the wildlife photographer of the year competition and how did it feel having all that kind of international attention suddenly thrust upon you from this image and and then also having your image displayed at the Natural History Museum as well, which is which is fantastic. Yeah, um, in all honesty, I'm not sure I could find words to fully describe um, how it felt. It was it was a complete whirlwind, and obviously, I, I didn't win um, the category. It was highly commended, but um, each year the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition released maybe like ten images that were highly commended to the press mm. a month. Before the winners are announced to sort of drum up excitement and my image was one of the ones that was released and um it had like gone viral on social media previously because it got picked up by the nat geo your shop page so that was sort of the first I think that's how i found it as well <laughs> sorry i think that's how i found it and discovered you at first as well possibly i just remember seeing this image like i don't know through maybe instagram or something uh, where it was shared uh, by National Geographic and I was just like wow this is incredible and I'm like well, who's the photographer it's like okay Laura Jackson give her a follow look for your work and it's like wow <laughs> <laughs> well thank you um yeah so I guess that was sort of like the first indication that I was maybe like onto something with with the image um and then when it got sent out to all the press you know suddenly I had like an interview with Sky News and I was so nervous I was so sucky when I was doing this <laughs> 
you. Um, and then the whole awards ceremony happened and it was so magical to have this event at the Natural History Museum after all the public had gone home. And um, I remember when I first walked into the exhibition, they had placed my image as the first one that you could see, which I was so surprised at because I, I think it's important to show both sides of nature, but I know that some people don't like the image because it's quite graphic. Mm. So I sort of assumed they would hide it maybe somewhere like around the back where you had to fully go around the exhibition to see it but it was like the first one people saw um right. which really blew my mind and it is because of that competition that i am sort of here where i am today now it enabled me to get my partnership with nikon and it really did sort of accelerate my career and i i have so much to be grateful for and are you, are you still kind of entering images into this competition and other competitions, say, every, every year now as well? Yeah, do you know what? I do try to do Wildlife Photographer of the Year every year, and I, I tend to get a few shortlisted, and I haven't, I haven't had any more luck so far. Um, <laughs> but I think that's why photography is so interesting, because it is fully subjective, isn't it? Like, yeah. that same lioness image that was awarded in Wildlife Photographer of the Year, the same year I entered it into European Wildlife Photographer and a couple of others, and it didn't get anything. So um, I think that's, like, the beauty of photography. Like, there's never one size fits all you could be in you could have an image on your hard drive that is capable of winning that competition but it might not get anything in others so I, yeah i think it's really fascinating but i hope i hope one day that i can i can get another award i'd like to win a category at least one day <laughs> <laughs> i mean i am to know this mpb oh sorry <laughs> well, i'm just gonna say i'm so competitive so like yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was it. Like I entered in like this MPB, like amateur photographer of the year competition with like some images, and I, th I think I came like fourth out of the top. Oh, that's you know, amazing! In the top ten, so I just put on my Instagram, nearly an award-winning photographer. <laughs> awesome! Yeah, no, it's it's a great feeling. I think competitions are really important as well because it helps you curate your own work. When you're limited to how many you can enter, you really have to be quite critical of your own work and I think that actually helps you moving forward when trying to come up with more creative compositions or um just trying to think outside the box no absolutely and <clears throat> excuse me also you, you kind of obviously touched on there that you've become part of the Nikon family as well I mean um tell us about like your favorite assignments since becoming an ambassador with them and you know what type of what's what's your favorite go-to gear as well Oh my gosh. So I feel very lucky because I, my partnership with Nikon has enabled me to jump straight up to the mirrorless range. So before, before my partnership with Nikon, I was shooting on an entry level DSLR uh, with a Sigma lens because that was all I could afford at the time. Yes. And now I'm, using, <laughs> now I'm using the Z9, which is the most incredible camera I've ever seen. And I think we'll probably ever see. Um, I love my 70 to 200 f 2.8. I think it's I think it's so amazing, especially for capturing wildlife and the environment. Yeah. Um, I do often use a 100 to 400. I like the flexibility of having the varied focal lengths. Um, and then sometimes I get to loan amazing gear from Nikon. I've recently had the 400 mil f 2.8 with the inbuilt teleconverter, and I've also tried the 600 mil f 4 on an assignment with them to Norway, which was amazing and i'm trying to work out how i can get my hands on that lens permanently but um yeah no i feel so lucky and i i've had quite a few amazing assignments with nikon already um i feel like i have to briefly mention three because first of all they came up to my home where i live with my partner the isle of mall yeah. which is one of the most incredible places for wildlife left in the uk it is. so it was it, it was felt really special that they were shining a light on some of the species that we do still have here because we are notoriously awful at caring for wildlife and we're you know one of the most nature to please countries in the world so it is nice to shine a positive light on the spaces that are thriving still um i have to mention the trip to norway that i did this february because it was um an amazing trip to dovrafell where we were working with the muskox trying to photograph them in the snow which was 
incredible. I've never had an assignment like that before. And it was also shining a light on three other incredible women in wildlife photography. So Rachel Bigsby, um, Ava McKinnon and Lena Kayser, who were all Nikon creators and are all fabulous. Mm -hmm. So I felt like that was really important just to show that, you know, like women can do it just as well as men. Um, and then the other opportunity that I, I loved working with Nikon on was actually a project between Nikon and Waterbear, the streaming platform. And right. my partner, George, and I traveled to Switzerland to understand more about the links there. So basically, in Switzerland, they reintroduced the links secretly about 50 years ago without getting permits or permission from anyone. And they do have around 250 links there now. Um, mm. But it was sort of asking questions to the scientists, you know, like what problems are there? What's been beneficial? What's worked? What hasn't worked? What are the um, opinions of local communities and farmers and hunters and this, that and the other? And all of it had the overall aim of getting people in the UK to question whether we potentially had space to reintroduce this predator. Um, so that was a really fascinating project. And I loved that because it really combined my conservation background with my photography. Yeah, I mean, obviously talking about links, it's it's obviously has been a big discussion to reduce them in Scotland as well, uh, as, as as well as wolves, um, which I think would just be amazing. But it is obviously dealing with the wildlife persecution that we suffer in the UK so badly. I mean, we only have to look at raptor persecution here to know that the UK is just not ready for this yet. And also the lack of forestry we have here. Absolutely. I think um, with the rewilding campaigns, it's very easy to sort of focus on getting them here. But what we learned in Switzerland is that it's not just about the reintroduction phase or getting permission to do that. It's afterwards you have to deal with so many factors, like making sure um, the habitats are connected enough to allow for gene flow. Otherwise, you get problems with genetic diversity. Um, so and, and also the ongoing work with local communities. I think there that because they now have wolves that have come back to Switzerland, everyone's sort of forgotten about the lynx. <laughs> but before, <laughs> I know that farmers and hunters were, well, had mixed feelings about it. And um, you're right, I think we need to make sure that there's proper infrastructure in place and support for it before we even attempt it. Otherwise, um, it would just be an uphill battle. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Like My, my wife is from a very small town in Germany um near near like dresden um that side and one of her friends is a, is a farmer and he had you know lots of deer and stuff like that and he's got massive fences surrounding the surrounding the, the paddock for the deer and um, one day he went in there and there was about 15 or 20 deer which were just absolutely slaughtered um by a pack of wolves that managed to break in and Oof. he had to kind of figure out ways of okay can i get compensation from the german government um mm -hmm. but then there's so many different rules like right your fences have to be so high and also dug so deep so you know these predators can't go get in there and mm -hmm. it's, it's just kind of crazy how these how these things work yeah absolutely i think there's a lot of hoops to jump through um but one interesting thing that we learned about the lynx was that they don't have that kill frenzy that foxes and wolves do. So they will only kill one animal, even if they're amongst a herd of or a flock of sheep, for example. Yeah. Um, so I think that's like one thing going for them. But yeah, you're right. There's, there's so much bureaucracy and politics involved in wildlife, which is uh, kind of crazy, actually, because I guess it should just be able to exist without needing permission from anyone or anything but you're right like raptor persecution is so prevalent still and um even recently they took some white-tailed eagle birds from here on mull and reintroduced them down in the isle of Wight. and i think three or four of them were either poisoned or shot by farmers so i don't think that we are necessarily ready but i also think that in general we as a nation are quite hypocritical i think Quite often we look at farmers in Kenya, for example, and get really angry if they've speared a lion, and yet we're not willing to live alongside small cats um, whilst they're herding alongside big predators like lions pretty much every day. So it's quite interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And to go on to say your conservation efforts as well is, I mean, you've obviously now become an author with your book, Where Did All the Rhinos Go?, I mean, how, um, what does like your conservation entail and how did this come about in, in terms of the book as well? Yeah, so uh, 
Uh, first of all, obviously, you know that I've worked with rhinos. Um, so I worked with them for my master's. And then I had a couple of follow-up projects that I did after my master's had completed. And I am head over heels in love with these animals. I think they're absolutely brilliant. And I think they're harder to... Um, I guess get support for than some other animals like elephants, which we humans tend to sort of connect to innately because they, you know, exhibit emotions when one of them passes away. I think we really um, assign them human emotions, which makes it easier to connect to them and want to save them. Whereas rhinos are maybe not quite as charismatic or or don't show human emotions in the same way that elephants do. So maybe getting support for them is a bit more difficult. Um, but I think a lot of people don't understand or don't realize how prevalent poaching still is. I think it's something, a term that you heard as a child and you kind of assumed that as time's gone by, it's disappeared. And it hasn't. We're still facing a huge poaching crisis. Uh, I think currently we, we're losing about one rhino every 16 hours. And rhinos are really slow breeders. They don't reach sexual maturity until about seven years of age. Um, they're pregnant from between 15 to 18 months, depending on what spe- which species it is. And then the calf stays with the mother for three years. So we're just losing them more quickly than they can reproduce. Yeah. Uh, I feel really strongly that we should be introducing conservation concepts at a younger age. I think the fact that I didn't know you could work in conservation until I was at university is an absolute travesty. I think there are so many children who would want to help save nature or save wildlife or work with wildlife that just don't know about it and therefore go down other routes. So I think something like poaching is a very easy topic for parents to stray away from. And I wanted my book to be that entry level into explaining why we're losing rhinos to children, obviously in a compassionate way. Mm. Um, but also just to be a conversation starter. So at the back of the book, there are questions that um, parents can talk to their children about and like resources where they can find out more information. But I just think that children are so compassionate. They're so innately compassionate and um, have so much empathy for things that if we can tap into it from a younger age, I think the world will be a better place. Absolutely. And uh, for, say for anyone who does watch this video as well, I'll pop the link in the description below. Uh, I believe it was on Amazon. Is that right? Yes. Thank yeah, you. Super. So I'll pop the link in the description below to the book. So it's well worth checking out. But um, we're say, so unfortunately, we're almost out of time, which is crazy because <laughs> yeah, I've had a great conversation here. It's absolutely flown by. Um, <laughs> But what, what's next for you in the coming years? What you know? What would you like to kind of do next? Is there any kind of regions you'd love to go to next? Um, do you know what? It's all a bit up in the air. Um, I definitely want to make sure that whatever projects I'm doing, they're purposeful um, and have a net benefit. Obviously, I, I feel very privileged that I'm in a position where I can travel to amazing places to tell the stories. But I, I would never want to travel if I didn't think that the work I was doing was worth it or had a real benefit so um i'm trying to find sort of projects that i think really need telling um unfortunately those are the ones that are often hardest to come by in terms of funding because they're not covering a big charismatic species or something like that but yeah there's lots of ideas that i have i definitely love to explore the wildlife closer to home especially around europe because we actually have some incredible wildlife in europe we do. Um, and i definitely want to continue raising awareness for rhinos. I'm, I'm now an ambassador for Save the Rhino and I'd love to go out to a couple of their projects over the next few years and, you know, just help document the incredible work they're doing so that they can use any content for fundraising and, and things like that. So there, there are a lot of formulating thoughts. There are a lot of thoughts going on in my head that I have to formulate a bit more. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just anything that's going to help raise awareness of, of the plight of, of wildlife. Yeah, see, my my passion has always been the Arctic and Antarctic. Like, they're two places I've just always wanted to visit, you know. So, obviously, you've got your iconic polar bears. I'm a huge fan of Arctic foxes. I got to spend a couple of days in Iceland. Well, I was in Iceland for 10 days last October, and I spent a couple of days with an Arctic fox that was used to me. It was just, it came up to, like, our little cabin and was just having 
the time of its life and went inside my bedroom and all sorts. It was like, what's going on here? It was so cheeky. Um, so I got managed to get like some nice shots of, of this fox as well, but it was stunning in its white, all white fur. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. A- Arctic and Antarctic regions are right up yeah. there. I think Svalbard is going to be one for me in the future. I, like, I couldn't agree with you more. I've actually been researching Svalbard and Arctic foxes in Iceland recently. Um, <laughs> and obviously I'd love to go to Antarctica. I think um, I think it's an incredible place, but... Um, you need about 20 grand to do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not sure that's going to happen anytime soon. So. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I'd just like to explore uh, wildlife around the globe in general because, yeah. because I specialised in rhinos for my master's and then worked in East Africa after... I'd completed my studies. Um, obviously, I've, uh, most people would be very envious that I was in that position, and I'm so grateful that I was because I feel like I've been so spoiled, and I've like <laughs> worked with species that I dreamed of working with since I was like four years old. Um, but because I've like specialised in East Africa, it hasn't given me many opportunities to actually look elsewhere. And I'd I'd love to do the salmon run, for example, in Alaska and things like that. So, oh, okay. yeah, that's why I do. Oops. yeah uh, going across the screen <laughs> i don't know if you could say uh, if you can see me yet uh, obviously you had the technical issues earlier but my cat just ran right past my face <laughs> oh, yeah i still can't see you i've been talking to a blank screen the entire time <laughs> but yeah uh yeah sorry we were saying that like the salmon run i mean yeah like to see yeah. like brown bears and stuff i mean finland's also on my list um to photograph bears yeah, definitely. And for example, I'd love to go to Borneo to do orangutans. I just think they oh, yeah. are the most incredible primate ever. And um, unfortunately, I'm not sure how long they have left. So I'd love to yeah. help do what I can over there too. And um, I just think that's why photography is so amazing, because if you get an image that really does go viral or um, people connect to it, it does transcend language and it gets so many people interested who are potentially outside of your echo chamber. And I think that's something that um, I'm really exploring because a lot of my, the, a lot of the people that I interact with on social media are already interested in wildlife and conservation. And it's trying to reach the people beyond those realms to tell them what's going on, um, which is, I think the way we can make the most difference. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Just, just got to re- resonate with, say, all of these untapped resources out there and hopefully just make a change for the better because our, our world needs it. Exactly. It really does. And I think I think we're getting there. Like more and more people are getting interested in nature and interested in wildlife. I think especially during the pandemic when we were stuck inside and weren't allowed to go out and explore yeah. the great outdoors, I think people really realised how much we rely on nature for our mental health and well-being too. Absolutely. So I do think there's a change, there's change of foot, and I, I am interested to see where it's going to go in the next few years. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I think that's about the time because I think my Zoom is going to cut out in a moment. <laughs> but uh, no, thank you so much for joining me, Lara. That This has been an absolutely fantastic talk. And maybe if I get to see you in Mole in November, hopefully if you're around, um, but obviously we'll speak obviously before then as well. But thank you so much again. That would be awesome. And thank you so much for having me. I, honestly, I feel like we could chat for another couple of hours. But um... uh, We easily could. <laughs> yeah no thank you so much and um i hope everyone in, enjoyed the chat <laughs> absolutely will you take care and i'll speak to you soon see you later see ya bye